Hello and welcome to yet another special episode of the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald and I am currently not in Munich. I'm in the lovely city of Los Angeles, California in a lovely little office here in the Bayside of LA, I would say, with someone probably a lot of you would not necessarily recognize or realize right from the beginning because this is someone who's not coming traditionally from the car industry, which is mainly our, um, you know, our most important talking point. But we have been talking a lot about product design lately. So I thought I'm going to invite someone to the podcast. And uh, thankfully, he has invited me to his office. Welcome to Oliver Zeil from uh, Belkin Industrial Design. Hey, Martin. Welcome. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank Two you. Germans in the office. Two Germans in the office. We will be doing this in uh, uh, in English, of course, because, you know, we, we thought like the German would be a little bit strange. But uh, the the idea about this podcast was, you know, what I just mentioned. Was like we've talked about the influence of product design, especially on the, the transportation industry over the past year. So many times in, in the Gestalten podcast that I... I wanted to get someone in who can give us really an idea of A, what is product design? And B, you know, what can we as the, the transportation design industry learn from these guys? Because in the end, you know, it's it's still design, it is designing a product, oftentimes a little bit smaller product than, than the car, um, but not necessarily less complicated in terms of the functionality around it. So uh, Oliver was so kind to take you know, some time out of his busy schedule and have a conversation with us. So, uh, yes, Oliver, thanks very much for that. And uh, how about we start a little bit with uh, you explaining to the audience about your day-to-day -day job and a little bit about Belkin as well. Yeah, gladly. Well, so thank you very much for thinking of us here in, in Playa Vista. You had the good idea to come by. Uh, hopefully not the worst place in the world to visit right now. Coming from Munich, I know the weather is not quite maybe as friendly as it is right here. So, um, yeah, uh, I've been here now uh, half my life, so uh, since uh, 1996, and uh, came here through Art Center College of Design, mm -hmm. where, of course, you're very familiar with uh, transportation design being really uh, an incredibly important subject matter and maybe the claim to fame to mm -hmm. begin with for Art Center College. And also something, of course, that drew me in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I have a big affinity for the beauty of cars and the the, the technical nature and all of that good stuff of uh, anything related to transportation. So I'm happy to be involved in a conversation like that. Belkin uh, has been around for something like 36 years now. And uh, it was um, a Los Angeles uh, founded company by mm -hmm. Chet Pipkin, who um, until very recently owned the company, privately held. Um, Consumer electronics as accessories mm -hmm. is the business we're in. We make anything and everything you can imagine you would plug into a, a phone, mm -hmm. uh, anything around mobile computing, laptops, power supplies, battery packs. We used to make a lot of cases, we make a lot of cables, we make stands, holders, anything you could possibly imagine around that. We also own um, two additional brands, actually three additional brands. Linksys is um, one of the world's most well-known consumer networking brands. Mm -hmm. Uh, routers and switches, mm -hmm. uh, uh, amongst other products. We also have uh, been in the smart home business for many years mm -hmm. now. We're one of the first companies to invest in that since about 2000. And I want to say 2009, 2010. Our brand there is Wemo, mm -hmm. uh, smart home devices. And we recently founded another company called Finn, P-H-Y-N, where we deal with smart home water systems. Mm -hmm. So. We are really all over the map when it comes to consumer electronics technology. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of products in our portfolio. Um, since I've been with the company, it's almost it's just over 19 years. Probably a thousand, a good thousand products went through our development cycle here, and so we got a large foundation of products that I can speak to you about <laughs> in any great depth you would like. Um, yeah, so maybe that's a good introduction. Yeah, that's that's yeah. absolutely great, and. Um, so just to kind of, you know, let, let, let you guys know a little bit what we want to do with this is we want to talk a little bit about, um, obviously, Oliver, you and your team and how you design um, and how it does compare to the car industry and, and then play a little bit of a game of thinking about, okay, so if, an, if a product designer, industrial designer would actually come in and say, like, look, let's do a car, how would the approach that you guys are working 
go into the car industry. But uh, before we do that, we go to the basics. And you've mentioned you have a lot of products, but you don't have necessarily a thousand designers doing all these products. So how is it that you work on all these products with your team? Do you have specialists? Is everybody doing everything? Or um, how how is the the general and you don't have to go into detail with much of yours, but obviously you know speaking also in, in regards to your colleagues, how is this kind of general product design studio set up? Mm. Well, a product is typically in our world products aren't even close to as complicated as a car would be, and if you think of all the systems involved in a vehicle, uh, there's so many sub- subsystems uh, involved that it's almost impossible, I think, for an, an individual to really be able to honestly work on e- on all of them equally. When you deal with a product, at least in our world of products, it's actually eminently possible to be an expert in the entire battery pack mm. or a wireless charger or a cable. Those are not that complicated from an industrial design perspective. Um, so I think... It's really the system's complexity level that we're dealing with that it makes it really possible for people to be engaged very deeply on a lot of different kinds of products. Mm-hmm. Typically, what happens is people become subject matter experts in certain aspects of mm-hmm. product development. And because our development cycles are very quick, you know, we're dealing with in six months or so, you know, cycles, ideally, uh, sometimes shorter, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, the turnover of projects is such that you have to deal with multiple mm-hmm. projects at the same time. And uh, if you don't want to retrain somebody over and over uh, and thereby lose your advantage of speed, you really have to have people who are good at certain types of products, have mm-hmm. done it before, develop some knowledge of how to do that efficiently and do it quickly. And our claim to fame, I put that in quotation marks, is uh, that we know what we're doing mm. very quickly. So we don't have to go through a lot of cycles of development and then scrapping ideas and do it over again. Uh, when it comes to industrial design, our form language, our, our competency and finding the right kind of uh, physical expression of user experience needs, uh, we, we usually typically are pretty close to begin with. And then we develop the, the kind of icing on the cake, the best CMF that we can mm-hmm. come up with, uh, the most efficient solutions, um, we deal a lot with cost in our yeah. very, very comp- competitive space. And we work closely with engineers to, to build the things the way we want them. You know? So to answer your question, I think um, people are typically able to deal with many different types of products mm-hmm. in, in their career in short, uh, short increments. Um, but occasionally they get stuck a little bit yeah. in certain categories that does happen too. We try to give people the ability to jump around with mm-hmm. different products when possible. Cool. And in regards to the actual, let's say you you have one product, and let's take the comparison with just a car in general. So in the car, you would say you have a designer, you have a modeler, model can be three D, can be physical, and you have an engineer. Yeah, you know, in a very basic kind of way. Now. Is that how it works here as well? So do you have your creative people and your modelers? And obviously, yes, you do have the engineers and I would I would expect you have 3D printers and stuff like that as well. But do you have that clear kind of structure between a creative person and a modeler? Or is that all one for you? Or how, how, how does that work? Yeah, this is uh, very clearly different. So um, you're correct. We, we use 3D printing more and more. We also have a traditional model shop. And- uh, available to us when we need it. Um, but for us, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very critical that every one of the industrial designers is able to run their own 3D printing uh, mm-hmm. machinery. We have staff in our model shop that helps us execute all that, but it's more about maintenance of the machinery. Uh, but everyone uses, for example, SolidWorks. That's our tool of choice. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's pretty easy for people to just create their own prototypes. So the, there is no such thing as a modeler uh, in our world. Um, we we work very closely with mechanical engineers, mm-hmm. with electrical engineers, and I think that's another uh, probably a difference. I think in sort of timing, where you you don't spend a lot of time building the ideal product yeah. and then figuring out how to make it. Yeah. That happens also, yeah. but typically, if you were to go about things that way, your cycle would get very very long. So there there are products who uh, which um, do get that kind of treatment. But that's typically not the kind of uh, commoditized product that would be a product that would be reserved as a kind of a special type of product that yeah. would find its way maybe into an Apple store or yeah. some other uh, retail outlet. Uh, so typically we're, we kind of require 
our team to make very fast decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and therefore, we also empower the designer to take on a lot yeah. of that responsibility of creating the right kind of volumes yeah. or, or spaces or even, uh, you know, if you know a little bit about engineering and, and uh, molding, for example, it's very helpful yeah. to know about wall thicknesses of plastic parts and parting lines and draft angles mm -hmm. and textures and things of that nature. So everyone on the team becomes quite an expert on how to actually make something. Mm -hmm. And it really becomes something of, of a great, I think, matter of pride when you are able to pretty much make anything at some point, you know, you learn the basics of how to mold something or how to stamp something or how to texture something. And you kind of understand this entire uh, world of possibilities opens yeah. up and then people think, oh, I might as well design a car. Maybe, you know, maybe somebody has that, that idea that, oh, this must be translatable to a bigger scale. Yeah, I mean, this is what we what we what we want to understand is be you know we we have talked a lot about the product design influence on transportation design, and it started off mainly with interiors, but obviously we can draw a very easy line uh, that connects an interior to let's say an accessory. I mean, you know, you guys are probably doing stuff that is used in a car as a third party device or or something like that. So there will be an understanding of, okay, so how do these individual car interiors work? And I think we're more and more moving towards this really understanding of what product design is coming into the transportation industry. Best example nowadays from a, from an exterior perspective is obviously that Honda, uh, Honda E that everybody says, like, oh, you know, the product, it looks like a product. It looks like a product. Um, also like, you know, a, a bite in interior, for example, which is very clean, very simple. Um, but from from your perspective, and let's say your understanding of product design, if you hear people talk about you know product design in cars, do you relate to that in your capacity as you know head of industrial design, head of product design, or do you think just like maybe they haven't gotten yet what product design is? Oh no, no not at all. I don't think that's that's how I would look at it. I think I have huge respect for people who work in all these different industries around all the different challenges they have with navigating their their systems and legacies of, of industrial production and scale and and uh, legislations and regulations and all of that, right? If you look at um, automotive or you look at any transportation mm -hmm. like aviation, you know, it's easy to forget that everyone there works around a, a mesh network of, of tremendous regulatory uh, compliance challenges. So, I mean, you can almost literally read it off cars when weird things happen on vehicle bodies and you just know you just know as a designer you look at that and you're like this was not the intent yeah, yeah. they had they were forced to change that because somebody figured later on that there's a regulation in place that they have to work around so i have great great respect because i've done this too long to have the <laughs> sort of ignorance that they just did something wrong yeah. I, I i think um all product design, all industrial design at heart starts with UX, mm -hmm. right? So you, I think we all want to understand first, who is this for? Who's going to use it? Where are they using it? What are the circumstances? That's no different than a car yeah. to a cable. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the challenge in changing status quo and not just changing status quo in manufacturing, engineering, and, uh, in, and those kind of logistics, but also in the mind of a consumer to like open up um, pocketbooks mm. to make people not just pay attention to something that's new and different, but also then want to go out and take the risk of buying that is so big and so scary that I, I think I understand why it's so hard for industry to really make changes. So I just watched the, the unveiling of the brand new Ford uh, Mustang mm -hmm. E. Kudos. Yeah. I'm not somebody who's traditionally like a Ford Mustang yeah. fan. Although I thought the previous generation Mustang was pretty cool. Um, but wow, that's a pretty nice car. But did they open up a whole bunch of new, you know, like paradigm shifting ideas? Absolutely not. They looked at Tesla and kind of Im imitated the way. I'm sorry, I didn't sit in one yet. Okay. So take this with a grain of salt. Anyone who works at Ford, I love you anyways. But the point is, this kind of looks like a Tesla interior, mm. which is exactly the right way to go about it because you know people have already accepted yeah. So I feel like the the in, there's an underappreciation I think in people who are not part of the industry 
in what it takes to make the right choices of how far to go with something. Yeah. Because you can easily go too far and then nobody's going to buy that stuff, yeah. right? So if you look at how many people are involved in the supply chain and manufacturing, mm. the 100,000 people or more, I'm probably going to get the totally wrong number yeah. here. But would you want to jeopardize that by going too far? I wouldn't. So I understand um, so I have great admiration for people that work in those in, in, in those industries. And in fact, I think car industry, the car industry, uh, Detroit, people in those companies are tremendously creative and amazingly imaginative. I think they're just kind of bound to some of those tight knit um, limitations that mm. are there because the companies have been around for a long time. And how do you break out of that? Well, you got to start fresh. The only way to do that is you got to do something completely new, mm. I think. Let me challenge you a little bit on this one because um, I think this is this is where we're really just talking about design. And I believe no matter if it's transportation, automotive in particular, product design, industrial design, but if we were to say, if we want to change something, it has to come out of the creative minds and it has to become, I mean, Ford was a good example because when they did the new GT, that happened in this little, you know, on underground box almost it was like you know an office that nobody used and they just kind of went in there and said like okay guys now let's do something that nobody knows about and only a handful of people were in, in, in involved but i'm always asking the question if if the creative people and in particular the high level guys they said oh you know we always want to change these kind of things i don't think they're pushing enough to make these these changes because that's in the end where where Elon with Tesla changed everything. He said, you know, I have the balls to do something new and we have to push the envelope if we want to get there. It's like nobody else will help us to do that apart from ourselves. So, you know, I think it's the responsibility of the designer. And I mean, this is also why we have this conversation to learn from others, to learn, you know, yeah. why, why can you make this? And then it doesn't matter if it's, you know, in your office, there's a picture of a, of a, of a bicycle, you know, like, a, you know, if it's someone like that, or if it's Lego or like whoever, but learning from those guys to change something. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, the, the product design industry seems much more open to these kind of connections. I mean, mentioned earlier, the office is next to Google and Facebook and Yahoo and all these things. Um, and the interaction that you guys have is probably a much more open one. And let's say you're walking into Franz von Holzhausen's office at Tesla. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, why do we not combine our stuff? Is it, mm -hmm. is, 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 do I have the right feeling about this kind of exchange? The stakes are so much higher. Mm -hmm. The reason why Elon Musk was able to do that is because he had his own cash and he was able to be that visionary guy. Mm -hmm. I think those people are very far and few in between. So if you're a new business founder and you have a bunch of independent cash and you have the kind of charisma and guiding sort of light in front of you mm -hmm. and you feel empowered to do something revolutionary, you can. But if you're tied into like GM or those are old, more yeah. larger companies and I'm, I'm going to group in everybody, you know, whether that's Toyota or Volkswagen, yeah. anybody, I'm sure the pressure that even the highest level uh, design people feel is always mitigated. Mm -hmm. uh, the financial aspects of it and there's a risk and reward involved so i i'm with you you know like i think designers need to push that's why we see lots of great concept cars but why are most of those concept cars not turning into great revenue generators that is because i think it's so difficult to understand where it's really financially worth it to mm -hmm. push really hard so again i have great a great admiration for people who are working in these high dollar high risk industries in the product industry, the money that is involved in, in a failure is far smaller. So if you're a large organization, you can you can live through a few failed product yeah. launches, yeah. you know. But if you have a few failed car launches, I think you're gonna be you're gonna be tough, you know. And you're not gonna make it as a CEO. You're not <laughs> gonna make it as the chief designer, right? That's right, sure. Yeah. So let's play around a little bit with an idea, um, and obviously we all know. Um, this is kind of the most talked about open secret ever. Uh, Apple was trying to do the Project Titan, which they tried to be, or like try to make their own car. Um, they've used suppliers, they've hired people to do that um, and everything. But in the end, from 
what is known to the broader public, or at least to the people in the in this kind of industry, so we're not talking about any kind of secret stuff here. Um, they stopped the project because they found it too difficult. It's you know too cash heavy and all these kind of things to um, to stop it. But let's actually say um, we have someone else like Tesla, like you know Elon, who has a buttload of cash and who says like we have to do something else with this transportation industry. And Elon said, okay, we do it with electric cars. Um, so there is a technology behind that he wants to push. And um, let's say, just for funsies, I'm the guy who has the cash and I want to change something. And I want to change something in terms of the way products are being designed. So I'm not going to hire a, a car designer or a traditional car designer, but I'm going to hire you as a, as a you know, coming from a, from a general kind of product situation. Now, You've mentioned, obviously, the UX perspective. And UX and car is very tricky. Um, I don't think it's as respected as a lot of th people think it is. Mm. Um, so you coming in, blank sheet of paper, no team in front of you. Um, what would you do? What would be your kind of first direction? And just to say, like, look, I'm coming from the product perspective. Mm. Um, what would I maybe do differently from what the cars are doing? What do I think is more efficient? What is it that I can learn? From the processes that we have mm -hmm. to deliver, <laughs> let's say better products. And better products for me includes everything, like you know, better looking, quality wise, uh, engineering wise, in terms of the communication that is happening within the team. Uh, everything. I'm not saying it has to be perfect, mm -hmm. but I'm saying, like you know, from your personal experience, what would you do, and, and what kind of direction would you push in? Mm. Wow, that would be really, really great. I know, I know, right? <laughs> well, okay, so from what I've learned about how uh, Tesla's learning curve had to work, I think it's it seems like it's smart to use existing platforms a little bit more, not to try to rebuild everything. That also meshes with Steve Jobs' hard-fought fight to make profitable products, yeah. but not all by himself, yeah. but also find partners to make them. So I also think uh, just... As a baseline, I do believe that people don't really care as much about what kind of drivetrains you have mm -hmm. in the car as long as it moves you. Yeah. So my first question is, who's the for? You know, who's who do we want to make a car for or vehicle for? And that's going to be the the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what happens a lot in car design is you have, uh, and and maybe I'm misinformed, but I think people um, there's there's a great desire to make aesthetically very kind of expressive vehicles that are, that are pleasing to look at and have a great stance and they sell themselves because they look well, you know, all that good stuff. Right? I think that's very important, but I want to understand if we're making another vehicle that competes against what's already out there mm -hmm. or can we generate a, a different kind of attraction from the usability of the mm -hmm. vehicle. Um, so this is where I think uh, there is a plethora of really interesting things out there. And, and I would probably look at out, um, criteria that are outside of the norm for vehicle and vehicles and how they differentiate from one another, which often I think is, you know, gas mileage and what's the badge on the front and can I get black leather mm -hmm. or only fabric or whatever. Like, it's just not really significantly different to me. But when I look at what Tesla's, for example, has done, we're using them a lot for good reasons as, as reference because they're innovative. Uh, they've put other criteria out there, mm -hmm. right? It's like, how do you charge more easily? How do you make a vehicle that looks like a, a normal car but offers all these benefits of uh, modern usability? So I'd look at what people desire to spend on a car, what would work with their needs for how much space they need to traverse. Uh, do they want to own a car or, or or not? You know, I think that's, I would be very interested in uh, trying to crack uh, maybe a, a younger audience to see what younger people would like to drive mm -hmm. or be driven in. Uh, and then I would really, really focus on on that first before I give anything a shape. Yeah. You know, like we always talk about that. Uh, of course, um, I, to me, form and a well-developed form is table stakes. You have to have that. Is not, that's, not a, that's not a benefit that a designer brings to the table. That's just table stakes. So that's presumed. Yeah. So what a designer needs to bring to the table is to understand what does this thing do mm. and why does it do it better than others? And then how do we connect with the marketing team well so that the marketing story really matches the design? I think that's kind of the ultimate 
when you understand what the target audience is, is maybe desiring, even without them really understanding it completely, but be smart and sensitive enough to envision what it could be. Yeah. But work hand in hand with marketing. I think that's often just not really maybe working so well, where marketing is maybe more of an afterthought. Um, but maybe that's how I would approach it. How is it then? It's interesting that you mentioned the marketing side because we had a little bit of a conversation earlier with, um, you know, Honda and all these kind of things. But um, is product design more driven by the product and then marketing comes in afterwards? Or is it, you know, almost like a starts at the same time or marketing is still there before? Because in the car industry, the especially at this moment in time, and LA is, the LA Motor Show is obviously coming up in a couple of days, but it's extremely driven by marketing first. So the design is, you know, there's a reason why they call it styling and not design is this is what the, what the market or what we think the market should have. Mm-hmm. So you can call this a, a certain arrogance as well, just to not look into the market, whereas the Japanese look very much into the market and then base it on that. Um, or how, how, how does this compare to to what you guys are doing mm. in terms of product, because I can imagine you obviously have a certain direction, especially when you do uh, accessories. Mm. Like, okay, so we have it has to fit into an iPhone. Right. <laughs> we can't just make it like you know five times bigger and then it doesn't fit anymore. The, 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 the function needs to be there. But who who decides on what is going to be done? Is it marketing? Is it you guys? Is it maybe like you know products that are successful at the moment? Or what is? How do you decide with your team like this is the direction we're moving towards? It varies dramatically, right? From product to product. We have a lot of products that come straight out of conversations with our customers, mm-hmm. where and the customer could be the, the retailer's merchant. I think a lot of it comes from that. They often have a early vision of what might be coming down the pipeline. We have a lot of internal in- innovation ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and occasionally we, we have, we know that marketing says, you know, our research consumer insights, which we do in house, um, our consumer insights give us in, an insight into what people are missing out in the market. Um, but it's really a mix of all three. It's impossible to say what comes first, mm-hmm. but in the ideal case, right? I think you have a good product idea that we know how to talk about. There are some really great, great marketing, um, marketing thinking ideas around knowing how you're going to advertise the product before you even start making yeah, the product. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's like a, an old idea that I think is really, really brilliant. You should write almost the, the idea was, I think somebody from Amazon uh, published that a few years ago said, Hey, you should write the, the marketing brief, yeah. which is basically the ad for the product before you start making the product, you know exactly what matters to the customer. Um, I think that's an ideal state that is often impossible to attain, not realistic. But I think um, the tragedy is when you make the product before you figure out how to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And that happens. It happens all the time. Just misalignments. I'm sure that's the same in all companies. Yeah, uh, you know? yeah that's, that's, that's the same. I mean, like, the car industry is, I would say it's too driven by marketing at this moment in time when we talk about um, the design perspective. Um, when we talk about UX in particular, I mean, you know, ask ask the people. And I think this counts a little bit towards the product design as well. But in general, like, you know, car industry, when you talk about them, and you, tap, and you ask the question, like, okay, what is UX to you? They can't give you a straight answer. It's like, yeah. okay, so you, you want to define something or you, you want to create something that is based on UX, but you can't really, um, you can't really define it. So it comes into a direction is where I'm saying, I think this is something to learn from the product because obviously the simplicity, like, a, you know, a simpler product that can be developed. And then, I mean, you know, you could, eat, I, I, I would make the case if you have um, an iMac, the new ones, or like, you know, an iPhone, I mean, they're complex products for the size that they are. And the car becomes so complex because of how big it is. But an iPhone or like, you know, um, any kind of phone, like you, you have an Apple Watch. So these tiny little devices become difficult to not just start but to design inside out Mm -hmm. and for me you know looking into all these products this is where we can learn because there's um you know when i when i use an apple watch when i use an imac and stuff like that it's like these are connected like you know you know they work in one place whereas if i have you know a car it's sometimes just okay the only thing that connects me with my car is like my key um rather than anything else uh, I have a rental car at the moment. I'm not going to say back which company it is, but um, it's completely overloaded with buttons. So you just like, 
You shouldn't have gotten a 911 again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You know, my, my budget's been way too high for this. Uh, <laughs> no, um, um, no, but this is exactly the point. You know, it's like, you know, w- where is the experience coming yeah. in? It's more about, it's like a commodity to bring something into the car rather than think about like Tesla did. Okay, so you have the screen. Maybe a screen only is not the greatest thing. Look at a Byton. There's people who like it and don't like it because it's one massive screen plus another one in the steering wheel. But it's thinking about the experience and then taking that experience and, uh, you know, really designing it from, and not just X, you know, the exterior and then the interior, but actually from inside out, which is the feeling that you had with Tesla as well. There was a clear inside out strategy Mm -hmm. and not necessarily like a differentiation. um, But look at the time it takes and the money it takes to get there, right? I mean, I remember our our, um, founder, Chet, he's a big Tesla fan and he's, He's got one of every one of the Teslas going back to the Roadster. And the first Roadster wasn't even close to as good as the newer cars. Yeah, are. And so I think what is so hard is, and you rightly identified it, right? So you have a, a, a systems thinking that envelops your lifestyle. And nobody's doing that better than Apple. It's just why people are stuck in the in this world and they can't come out of that anymore once they're in there. Like this is superior to... A disjointed experiences. I, I want more experiences that fit into this. Mm. That's why Apple TV is working well. Everything is just kind of nesting into, you know, further permutations of the same system. Mm. But to build that takes billions and billions and billions of dollars and thousands and thousands and thousands of people yeah. and tremendous risk. This could also fail, right? So I think the problem is that it's just not easy to say, we're going to build a new system. And all the car manufacturers, I think, are pretty much doing it, right? Mm. People are starting to use different kinds of keys. Instead of a real key, you have a kind of a chip card or some other or an iPhone, a watch like a phone, or a phone, whatever. right? So you have to tie systems together. And I think this is, this is very fascinating because in the product design world, the stakes are just so much lower. Mm. They're still high, perhaps, but they're not even close. Uh, exponentially smaller risk-taking, right? I think what we're probably going to find is that over 20 years or so, right? we're going to see further and further consolidation mm-hmm. of people just realizing they're best served by working together. And then you're going to find a part of the market working with Apple. You're going to find another part of the market working with Samsung. Yeah. And then they're all, something's going to, you know, VHS versus beta. You yeah, know, it's yeah. going to, something is going to happen. Or I think. Blu-ray versus uh, HDTV. Uh, exactly. DVD was the same thing. So I think that's a great idea, right? A great maybe analogy. I have an anecdote that is kind of funny about also when you bring in new things like that. Mm. So uh, networking routers are not the sexiest devices in the world. They're, everybody has one in their house. If you got Wi-Fi, you got probably something sitting somewhere with antennas yeah. sticking up, or you've maybe already moved to a device that doesn't have antennas sticking up. They both actually work exactly the same way. But there are people who will never buy that thing without antennas sticking up because they just don't believe that it's as good <laughs> as the thing without antennas. Yeah. That's not true. Yeah. But as product people, we understand that with marketing, right, ins- insights, we understand that we still have to have both in our portfolio so that we can have a product for people who are either not willing yet to maybe go to a device that has a simpler look because they, they believe that it isn't working as mm. well or, uh, or for whatever reason, we, we're able to do that. We can have two devices yeah. on the market, right? But you can't probably, I mean, if you said you had to make two different cars at the same time to satisfy both, the cost involvement is just so massively different. So that's why I think, again, like, yes, I think you're right. The, I think we're going to see that happen, but it's going to be painful. It's yeah. going to be associated with, I think, probably great losses of mm-hmm. jobs and, and consolidation. And there's going to be issues of environmental compliance and safety and all kinds of other crazy things security and in a hot topic in germany right that's um data security yeah we don't know yet how that's going to pan out but it's going to be kind of a fight yeah. and we're already seeing some brands left behind that are not willing or able to invest as heavily in new technologies but i think if you look at what a, an urban new generation younger people is expecting they're going to expect their car to work with their phone. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. Like, don't, like, I, I drive an Audi from yeah. 2013, which I love, but that thing has 2G internet in yeah. it. And, uh, 
and it doesn't actually allow me to like use my iPhone in the car the way I'd like to. Yeah. And I can't upgrade that thing. What the hell is that? <laughs> right? So that's kind of stuff just has to go. And, and so I think the level of systems sophistication has probably already stepped up dramatically. Yeah. But for example, what we'd like to be able to do is upgrade your Wi-Fi in the car. Yeah. Why wouldn't that work? Like uh, I unplug something, I plug something new in. Uh, or anything like that, the upgradability of systems and vehicles, that has to be uh, addressed just like product upgrade cycles are, right? Um, and I think that's going to happen. Just yeah. people want that. And if you go now and you go shop, car shopping, you're not going to find a lot of cars that don't have CarPlay or some other yeah. equivalent connect connection, right? So it's, it's fascinating. And I think there's just so much overlap. I, I'm pretty sure that most car studios have uh, have product designers yeah. that work there that are they just have a slightly different maybe mindset about the aesthetics versus the function and the UX to me to go back to that subject for a second. I think it's so much more than just you know how do you navigate an interface or something like that. It's so much more about how does this thing, this object fit into my life? Mm -hmm. Whether that thing is a wireless charger, or a car or some kind of transportation, it doesn't really matter. It's a fascinating research subject. And I would be really surprised if the big automakers didn't have teams of people already immersed in those subjects, trying to come up with solutions uh, that then sit somewhere and somebody has to figure out how to spend a billion dollars to make it happen. You know, how, how, and how do we unlock these kinds of investments? Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen because um, that that is inevitable. They're going to go under if they don't service the yeah. new generations. I mean, you you guys are quite special because you belong to Foxconn as well. That's um, correct, yeah. So, you know, with uh, Foxconn, obviously, to most people, is famous for being the manufacturer for Apple. You know? So if we would use a company such as Apple as a blueprint for the future, let's say transportation design companies, or like, you know, transportation companies. And then it can be a canoe that has like, you know, this little side, you know, skateboard style, and it can be like a proper car. But if I really break it down, I know this sounds quite harsh, but um, Apple has a lot of people, but in the end, what they need to do their, their products is a good marketing team, a good design team, and probably a few engineers, and then the rest can be outsourced. And I can clearly see that with everything that happened, that's going on at the moment with the simplicity of an electric car, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but the positive way, because I can go out shopping. I mean, I could, you know, it's almost like going to Amazon. It's like, oh, I want to buy this battery and this, you know, this chassis. I can go to Volkswagen nowadays. So um, from a from a principal perspective, mm -hmm. we're not that far away from each other. It's just the, I, I think the, the, the general idea of the, the size of the product, the complexity of the product, but if I can buy all of these things, and you just mentioned, you know, right, the CarPlay, you know, the Android uh, equivalent of it as well, do I even need, like, you know, apart from a screen, do I need anything or just like a basic Linux system or something like that? I plug in my USB and it, you know, puts on, it puts on CarPlay. So it seems like the general idea is becoming much easier. And this is where I certainly believe the idea of how product design, industrial design works you know, working with so many suppliers, working, you know, in a, in a very cost-efficient way because the competition is so big um, also means that you have to be inventive in how you do things. You know, can you use that again? Um, in the car industry, we call them carryover parts, you know, but how can you make sure that these carryover parts, you know, are becoming the most efficient way? So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, the idea of the product and the car is becoming closer and closer together because you can just buy stuff. I mean, you know, it, sometimes it just doesn't make sense for you guys to, I don't know, build your own buttons and stuff like that. If you can buy them from someone where, you know, hey, they're, they're, they're proven and they know what's going on. Yeah, I, I think if you look at products under the hood, you'll find an ex exceptionally small number of products yeah. that use non-standard stuff on the inside. You know, like Apple is one of the very few companies that will ever endeavor something that is under the hood that is not a standard Part. Because they have been so successful with their products that they can now afford to do that. They can afford to do that, and they decided that they want to do that, which is a top-down, design-driven, marketing-aligned yeah. 
idea and they follow through in a consequential way. There are other companies that are doing that. It's very rare because in only the very rarest cases does any consumer actually recognize it mm. and value it directly. So the hardest part is for you as a manufacturer to make people understand what you're spending and how you're making something exceptionally good for the sake of the customer mm. and make them see it and value it with the money. So only with years of, of like really sophisticated, I think, um, you know, um, fertilizing of that relationship between the customer and the marketing uh, of the product mm. and the product teams, can you build this kind of loyalty that comes along with this idea that you're making something special and yeah. it's unique? Um, so the long story short there is that everybody uses parts that are freely available to everybody, yeah. right, under the hood. And I think uh, the car industry is like that already. Yeah. I mean, if you look at how people are making things by different companies that you don't even know, you know, that it doesn't matter. The brand comes out at the end and it's something made by BMW yeah. or Volkswagen or whoever. So I think the future is probably going to be something that where some of the manufacturers will survive very healthily and handsomely because they have built really great supply chains that are very efficient, that are they are able to outsource to others, and uh, and then allow people to have uh, vehicles that eventually don't they're not owned by them. It, I mean, this is literally you can you can see it every day if you open your computer. You probably have some kind of iTunes mm -hmm. subscription. You may have done Disney Plus, right? We just signed up for that. Already spent too many hours on that. <laughs> um, but it's just this idea that you don't need to own it, yeah. but you can you can use it. I ride a jump bike to work, which I don't know if you guys have that in Munich, but these little it's just electric the assist. Just, uh, that's the Uber one, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. So it just arrived a few weeks ago. Right? I one of these or a scooter to work. I don't need to own that thing. Yeah. That model, I think, as far as I understand, is more and more popular with younger people. Yeah. And so I feel like this idea of ownership of an incredibly expensive piece of equipment that depreciates over time, mm. almost certainly not a good investment mm. in most cases, is just, an, I think, a rapidly outmoded way of thinking. And I remember, um, maybe this fits in here, but I remember when Elon Musk was interview interviewed um, about the Hyperloop concept. Mm -hmm. I find personally very fascinating and scary at the same time. Uh, he was talking about how people wouldn't have to pay for a ticket because it would be paid for by advertising. Yeah. And you, you know, this whole idea that you don't need to, th you need to think differently about the way you do business with people in the future, also with regards to transportation. So I find that exciting. I think you're going to have um, brands surviving that make cars, vehicles for people with a lot of money yeah. who don't really need to worry about how if they own or not. Those are always going to be status symbols. People are wired that way, right? That's clear. But the everyday cars, the Toyotas and Honda Civics and the, the vehicles that people with like limited means use to get from A to B, why wouldn't they become a completely different kind of system? Yeah. I think that's right for something, but it'll depend very, very heavily on who does it first. Somebody's got to do it first in a way that people really love. Yeah. I haven't seen that yet. Who do, you, who do you think has the most potential to do that? Do you think it's more a, a manufacturer? Do you think it's more a company like you know Uber? Mm -hmm. Or you know who do you think actually? You know, obviously we're speculating now, so it doesn't. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't expect you to say something for certain, but who do you believe has the most potential to do that and really succeed with it? I mean, honestly, I really, I'm not an expert in this, but the way I would think about it is if, and it's always such a big risk, right? If you, if you imagine a company like Apple applying the same principles mm -hmm. of marketing and design thinking to create a user experience around vehicles and interaction mm -hmm. with vehicles and maybe getting together with another company, they, they wouldn't probably build their own car. Why would they do that? It's this silly. Why don't Why don't you just use something that already yeah. exists that's really good? And who's probably better at you know manufacturing than you could ever do it? Exactly. Has maybe a hundred years of history, mm -hmm. so they can basically pick. Yeah. You know, any. I'm not going to even say anybody. I don't know, but pick a company that's very good at making vehicles and build a vehicle that provides you with not just a safety but also a nice user experience that you you enjoy. And you can make financial sense of it. They're gonna smash it. Mm. How and when? And, you know, I don't know. 
But look around. I mean, if you're in LA, I'm sure it's totally the same thing in, in Munich or anywhere else you go. We have bird scooters. We have lime scooters. We have um, uh, uh, jump scooters. We have wheels. There's another one. There's like at least four different types of scooters yeah. around here alone. Uh, and we'll see which one of those companies yeah, fails yeah. last. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't know how they finance this kind of debacle. I love using them, but I, I can't imagine how that makes money. But it's going to have to be a city where somebody's going to start trying something out. Yeah. And I know that happens more so in Europe. I've heard quite a lot about this kinds of sh car sharing models and all that. There's a lot of pressure yeah. on that as well. I think there's, you know, over here in California, this is what I always find extremely fascinating being here is compared to other countries in the world, like, you know, areas. Like if you go to China, in China, everything is quite led by the government. Just like, look, we need to be, you know, a world leader for this, so let's do it. In Europe, it's sometimes, well, like, I would say in most cases, like a reactionary thing. Mm -hmm. This is what you feel at the moment. You know, like, we, why do we have this stuff? It's more like, oh, crap, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, so what can we do to become a little bit more, modern in that sense because if you would actually you know go to germany the general kind of way of how you can use your phone or your phone as a device to pay for example is absolutely shambolic um, i think the leader for that is still the uk in europe like you know they are they're trying to digitalize a lot of things like you know contactless payment has been there for years i remember when i was living there it was already there uh, in Germany, this is just slowly starting. But like what they're doing over there is they try to do it properly. Mm -hmm. So they are bringing in, you know, the government. They're bringing in everybody just to kind of like, okay, we need to do this and so let's push this. If this is the right thing, I don't know. But over here, there is this. I almost want to call it lack of fear. Hmm. You know, where the people just say like, okay, let's give this a try. Especially in in California, I was in Dallas just a, a couple of oh, a couple of days ago visiting friends and everything. Um, the scooter situation is much different over there. Uh, obviously, you know, Texas is just huge, so people drive anyway, uh, almost everywhere. But there's not that much of this kind of spirit of bringing new things in, like testing out new things. I mean, there's a reason why Tesla has worked over here in California in particular. If you're on the streets over here, you see so many of them because the people are in a position financially, but also from a mindset perspective, to try these things out. So it's completely like, you know, a different idea of why these things are operating here and why things are being tried over here because mm -hmm. you have the people that take them on board. And that is something where I think California in particular is very unique. And I'm really interested to see how Detroit will cope with that mm -hmm. because um, they need to understand that where they are is 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 absolutely important to learn how to do things and you know i, I saw a few apple maps cars today driving around here uh, i'm pretty sure they had to you know some kind of uh, automated system and driving in there as well but it's just a completely different mindset here and it's the it's the same thing that you've mentioned i mean in germany you would not have facebook next to google next to yahoo that mm -hmm. would just not happen you know the mindset is like oh we go somewhere else it's like, okay, we want our guys to have lunch with the other guys. Just, you know, maybe we, we can learn some stuff. And, and this is exactly the case that you have here in California is this kind of push for something new and this fear of failure. I mean, mm -hmm. just look at, you know, how many Californian startups you have. Like, you know, you have Lucid, you have Tesla, we count into that, Faraday, you know, uh, Ceres, which used to be F SF Motors, and uh, there's there's a new one, uh, Neuron EV, I think, that started off as well. Why are they doing that here? Because the people don't have that fear of failing. You know, it's more just like, let's let's actually crack on with it and, you know, try to make the best for ourselves out of this as well. So um, that's why certain things work over here that I don't think would work over in Germany. It's more like, you know, like in Europe, it's like, Oh, it's being tested over there. Okay, let's do it. Then you know mm. we can do it better. You know that's almost like how I mm. feel a little bit. The car industry is let them do it, and then we'll figure it out. Well, if I mean, it's here because people have venture capital, mm. that's, that's part of the culture, right? I think that's really clearly um, why things are so California centric. Um, you said something interesting about China and how things happen differently there. There's some crazy stories about the car uh, bicycle sharing. Have you have you heard that story about this large bicycle sharing company that went under because some guy put uh, images of uh, the the um, 
the red the square, let's say the Tiananmen Square, um, with bicycles on it, and the government started cracking down, and yeah. then the entire company fell apart based on that. I, I'm always I'm always nervous when when we talk about, um, and I know you didn't mean it that way, but the the Chinese system yeah. enables things like this. And you can also disable. can also disable, yeah. and 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 I'm very concerned about that. But at the same time, uh, I think what that reminds me of is to make sure that we remember that we're not necessarily going to drive where this goes. In the future, we may very well see China own that completely yeah. because they are going to possibly put in place, you know, systems that are implemented in a city because the government says so. Yeah. And then you'll see an entire fleet of vehicles deployed just to try it out and see yeah. how it goes. Yeah. Uh, we may also see it from other countries like South Korea or mm -hmm. other like leading areas in which there's lots of people driving. Uh, I'm I'm fascinated by that. This whole aspect of European or, or North American kind of domination mm -hmm. of tech industry, we need to be very, very confident to know that other people are coming for yeah. it, you know, and the Koreans are doing an amazing job and so are the Chinese. Yeah. If, if I just contrast the amount of uh, quality, high quality product design talent we see from China today yeah. versus about 19 years ago when we first started doing business um, as Belkin, yeah. as a design team, there was basically nobody around yeah. that you could hire to do and work you for you. To arts and then the half the people is, uh, is That's funny. right. But now you go to the, the, the big universities in uh, Singapore yeah. or Hong Kong, uh, all the crazy stories we hear from Polytechnic in Hong yeah. Kong today, my thoughts go to these people. The talent that comes from these kinds of places It's tremendous. Mm. They are just as good as anyone from here. So they're coming for it. Yeah. And they're going to show us new ways of thinking that we haven't thought about. And it's going to make everybody, I think it's going to enrich the, the kind of conversation because people are going to put under more pressure to deliver. Yeah. No, I think um, I think you're 100% right. And I think this is actually a nice a nice ending to our little, to our little story. But... I'm not going to let you go because I always have three questions. <laughs> uh -oh. So in your kind of case, with these three questions, uh, two of them, are, we're going to open up a little bit further. So it's not just specifically on cars. Um, and one of them is very car specific. Okay. Yeah. So um, I hope um, I hope that's going to be all right. Now, the first one is um, which designer that you have or have not worked with in the past has inspired you the most in terms of oh, it's very you? easy that's very easy have not worked with biggest biggest inspiration ever is of course Dieter Rams mm -hmm. I mean how could you not love Dieter Rams uh, everything about him is awesome and I love him um, for many reasons I think he's just uh, an icon and um, he's been rightfully celebrated more and more you can see I even have like the, the Korean version of the the great poster Uh, for Gary Hostwitz's movie about him on the wall. Which, unfortunately, I have not seen yet, but I do have that turntable, actually, in real life, in my living room. I'm very jealous. I'm very <laughs> jealous. The <laughs> um, I have worked with, I have to give credit to uh, a person I used to work with uh, very much, is Ernesto Quinteros, who is now the chief design officer at Johnson Johnson, mm -hmm. who was uh, my mentor and in many ways still is. Uh, he... He really was uh, a great inspiration at the early years of my career. And he started this team uh, here at Belkin. Cool. Now, second question. And again, this does not have to be car related, but it can be if you would like to. Um, which project that you have not been part of would you have been, you know, would you have absolutely loved to be part of as a designer? Oh, that's also very easy. Uh, the Apollo uh, mission I mean, at being if I imagine having had an opportunity to touch anything related to that kind of endeavor, yeah. amazing. In the same token, uh, so I'm big into aviation yeah. and things like that. So, uh, you know, A-12, SR-71, uh, spy planes, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. My goodness. I mean, they. I don't think they really would have called themselves designers. They would have called themselves engineers. Yeah. But, you know, you see it now in what SpaceX is doing and everyone else yeah, in that industry. Yeah. They are absolutely employing good designers yeah, yeah. and really, really solid uh, ergonomics, usability, yeah. user experience. Uh, anything around um, aerospace, 
to me would be just uh, tremendous. Right? Yeah, I just don't like the turnaround times. That, yeah, well, like the, a little the, bit the, slow. The, the tens of years. Yes. That one. Okay, and now last, <laughs> last, last but not least, this is the car question. Okay. If I would give you an infinite amount of money, which car would you buy? Oh gosh, one. You have one, you're like, oh, you know, that's really because otherwise it would be like, you know, like you can give me your top three if you want to. Yeah, I like, always do this um, with my friends. And I said, if you had, if you could buy five cars, what would they be? Because I think one car that's almost impossible because then you have to compromise. Yeah. Okay, one car. What, I give which one would I buy first? Maybe. Well, okay, let's do three. Let's do three. Five would be a little bit too much, but let's do three. Okay, uh, Ferrari 275 D- Testa Rossa. Mm-hmm. Because. That car is just unbelievable. It's so beautiful. It just has like the sex appeal yeah. that you just can't. You can't buy a new car that would be that good. Um, I'm a I'm a G wagon fan. I want to buy a G wagon just because uh, of the the engine, yeah. the roaring engine. An original one, or like a, <coughs> no, the new ones. New one. Yeah, yeah, new one. Um, and a 911 GT3. That's a simple one. A couple, couple of German cars, one Italian car. Got to stick to the roots a little bit here, right? Yes. <laughs> I love the idea, by the way. I love, um, and having lived in LA for a long time now, I have grown out of automa- out of stick, uh, stick shift yeah. manual cars. But I used to love driving my Subaru uh, Impreza. And uh, I love wrenching a car. Yeah. And a friend of mine had a, a classic uh, 1981 Porsche 911 Targa. And he let me drive that a few times. Like, give me this, like, there's no assistance, yeah. you know, and the kind of manly activity of wrangling a gear lever around. I think that would be fun to do. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Well, you know, <laughs> the Porsche is always a good one. Yes. Um, and I think this is this is one of these kind of cars. I mean, if I ask, I think everybody I've asked a question so far never said a Porsche. But when we were off the record, they were just like, you know, obviously I didn't include the Porsche because everybody <laughs> likes it anyway. So yeah, like, you know, it's like, it doesn't really seem like that special car, but it is, especially here in California when you see them. I'm usually not a big Targa fan, but over here, you know, you, you drive the Targa. I mean, that's the new Targa, honestly, a nerd talk here. Yeah. But I think, hands down, uh, that is my favorite 911, the Targa um, with the beautiful, beautiful stainless steel. Mm, gorgeous. Lovely. Oliver, thank you very much. Thank you for doing this. Uh, next time we do this, hopefully maybe in Germany. That would okay. be that would be great. But I you know I'm happily coming again. LA is fantastic. And uh, obviously to your listeners, as always, uh, thank you very much for listening. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere, pretty much on social media under the Concept House tab. And uh, see you and hear you next time for the next special episode. Thank you guys.